Hi everybody, this is Mr. Matthew and this is video four of four in our biological evolution series. And in this video we're going to talk about models that demonstrate evolution of a population. And specifically what we're going to do is we're going to look at how populations shift um, or what are the causes that cause populations to shift over time. So uh, let's get started. So in video number three, one of the things that we discussed was the idea that things like antibiotics can cause a shift in population. And so antibiotics and pesticides are two of the major forces that we talk about. So in this image, what we see is we have an initial generation represented by that upper left-hand box. We see that some pesticides are spread and we see that a large number of the population dies. Not everyone dies, but some survive. And in this model, it appears that the red colored beetles seem to have some sort of selective advantage. And then later on, in later generations, we see that the population shifted from predominantly the white beetles to only a small percentage of red beetles to fairly even distribution. Then we spread a second time that later generation, and we again see that the white beetles are wiped out and the red become more prominent. Now, pesticide spraying and color aren't necessarily linked, but this does allow us to have a visual of how evolution could take place if we have certain variations within a population that are going to be selected for when we shift the environment or when the environment shifts. So in this particular case, what we end up seeing is that the red beetles have a selective advantage over the white beetles in an environment where pesticides are sprayed. So another big thing that we talk about when we talk about emergence of new species is the idea of isolation. And so specifically, we're going to talk about what happens when you have two populations and they end up getting separated to the point where they cannot reproduce anymore? And some of these barriers might be things like time. Maybe they feed at different times or they migrate to a mating ground at different times. We also have ecological isolation where we end up seeing uh, some sort of ecological barrier that separates them, such as a food source Behavioral isolation could involve things like mating behaviors. Uh, birds notoriously have uh, forms of sexual selection where they have uh, very specific songs or uh, very specific mating rituals where the females and males are attracted to one another. If one group starts demonstrating those and another group does not, then you will not see reproduction between those two populations. We also have mechanical isolation in which two individuals can no longer mate and produce offspring because literally the gametes cannot fuse due to mechanical isolation. We also have things like post-zygotic bar barriers where mating occurs. The two individuals come together and they mate and they form an offspring, but that offspring either is not born, um, the, the gametes uh, will, will fuse and initially start to form uh, an offspring, but that offspring doesn't actually uh, mature, or the hybrid offspring um, could be sterile. So in this particular example I show, we've got a group of fruit flies, this initial population of fruit flies, and what we'll do is we'll pull some of them and feed them on one type of food, and we pull another and feed them on another type of food. And then we allow many generations to pass. In this it says eight or more generations. I don't know what the magic number of generations for fruit flies is, but what we end up finding is that because of the separation of these two populations and their feeding, we end up finding that when we return those two populations back into a given area, they have a selection where the starch-fed flies prefer to mate only with starch-fed flies and the maltose-fed flies only mate with maltose-fed flies. Now we have, through our feeding, through our ecological isolation, possibly through some behavioral isolation, have created a situation where this one initial species has separated into two separate species. Another thing that occurs sometimes when there are shift in the populations, whether these are man-made or whether or not these are things due to environmental shifts due to weather or other phenomena, involve extinctions of species. And this particular example I've got shown here is the golden toad, and the golden toad became extinct uh, within the last few decades. And there are possible reasons for extinction. Now, all the ones I'm going to list here are ones that are hypothesized for the golden toad, but you'll see that they apply to other organisms as well. If, through development, we destroy portions of the habitat and we reduce the size of the habitat for a given species, what we'll see is there will be fewer individuals. Sometimes when that population size gets down below a certain level, 
the population just isn't healthy and they can no longer mate and reproduce and produce enough young in the uh, separated spaces that we've allowed them to live in. So habitat loss can be a profound threat to species and can drive them to extinction. Global warming also has an impact. We frequently see examples of marine species like coral or other species where because of the net effect of global warming, the environment is shifting in certain habitats, certain small habitats where specific species live, and as a result, we no longer see those species thriving in those areas, and they can ultimately become threatened. Disease is also another threat. Uh, in the case of the golden toad, we ended up seeing a specific type of parasite that is suspected at reducing population size. And we can also have pollution, and frogs are quite, um, frogs and toads are quite susceptible to pollution. So what we will see here is these toads were exposed to extra environmental toxins getting in that can have an impact on their survivability. It also can have an impact on their ability to reproduce. Obviously, there are many different things that can push species to extinction, but these are a few commonalities, and what these are doing is they're putting pressure on the population allowing only some individuals to survive and others cannot. And if we apply too much pressure, we may make it so that so few are able to survive that the species can no longer persist. Another factor we can talk about is genetic drift. And in genetic drift, what we end up seeing is that there is an initial population. And in this initial population, we have a very even distribution of our five different uh, color phenotypes. And that by chance, we select blindly different colors. And as a result of just the chance selection that we pull from that initial population, we had a different distribution in the next generation. And we then blindly pick again, we'll again see a different distribution, we'll pull again, we'll uh, see it. And then over five generations, you'll see the shift, and over 10 generations, you'll see the shift. And the key thing with genetic drift is this is a component of chance. A lot of times this is tied to the idea of founder effect. If we were to take a population and break off a small group of them and send them out to, say, an island habitat. Or there is a shift where there's a river that separates a small group from a population from the larger population. The trend is that we do not see the same distribution in the small separated group that we saw in the broader population. In other words, the percentages of allele frequency we saw in the general population are not going to be mimicked exactly in that small isolated group. This is the nature of genetic drift because now this new subpopulation is going to have different allele frequencies and when the environmental pressure of that new environment is applied, there's going to be different survival rates. So in this particular instance, we see a shift over so that red ends up dominating the eventual population that we see in the end. This could be because the red population was better able to survive at a higher altitude or it was better able to survive um, in a rockier soil or red was better able to survive in whatever the conditions are of this isolated group. Whereas the initial population, the conditions are different and so there's different environmental pressures. So this is one of the ways that we can end up seeing a small group branch off and then have a fairly rapid evolution in their new isolated environment. And that process is called genetic drift. Another key component of taking a single population and breaking it into two is the idea of gene flow. So in gene flow, what we mean here is that the genes can go back and forth between uh, two different groupings. So in this particular case, we have red birds and blue birds, and we have this mountain that is separating them. But perhaps the mountain is not particularly large, and these birds live fairly high up, and the birds can get from one side to the other, and they can mate. That would mean that there would be gene flow between the two populations. If, however, the mountain became too high and it blocked off gene flow between the two groups, that would prevent gene flow and we would no longer see the genes from the population on the left side of the mountain mating with the genes from the right side of the mountain. If gene flow is blocked, that is one of those forms of reproductive isolation we talked about before, and those two populations will start to evolve independently. So disrupting gene flow or maintaining gene flow is going to have a big impact on whether or not we separate a single population into two species or if we maintain that population as a single species. And obviously this can be much more complicated than this, but this is a very simplified example of how important it is uh, for gene flow to exist in order to maintain a single population or how important breaking it apart or blocking gene flow is to creating separate species. Another 
major factor we see is mutations. And we talked about this earlier in some of the earlier videos. Mutations are the source of all new alleles that we see. So what we can do is we can take the alleles in the population, we mate, we can shuffle them around, but to get novel alleles, what you need to do is you need to have a mutation occur causing there to be a new phenotype that occurs. So this is like one of those classic examples. This is the pe peppered moth example. You probably have seen the peppered moth. So the peppered moth uh, is the idea that on the English countryside back in the early 1800s, uh, there were these moths. And every once in a while, there were some dark gray moths, whereas most moths were peppered where there were black flecks separated onto the white. And in the unpolluted English countryside of the late 1700s, early 1800s, the peppered moth had a direct advantage over the dark gray moths because they would blend in with the tree bark. However, during the 1800s, during Industrial Revolution time where we see much more pollution come about, what we later see is that there are a darkening of the tree bark by pollution, and now in this new darker bark environment, the dark gray moths have an advantage because they can blend in with the tree bark. The white or peppered moths are not going to be able to survive and reproduce, and as a result, we see a shift in allele frequencies from the whitish or peppered colored moths to those of the dark gray moths. Now, this is also seen in allele shifts when we talk about antibiotic resistance. And so in antibiotic resistance, we'll have the initial population. If we apply antibiotics, what we'll end up seeing is that only some of the individuals will survive in the presence of antibiotics. They will mate and reproduce, and we will see a shift in the population towards a more highly resistant population um, fairly quickly. And uh, we'll show some other examples of this in class, but this is a, an example that how did we get the yellow to red variation um, in this population? There were some random mutations that happened before the presence of antibiotics that created this variation within the population. All right, so this brings us back to the overall pattern of natural selection, which is one of the driving things that we've been talking about. And the idea here is that we start with an initial um, group of individuals, they end up having offspring within that, that population. There may be some mutations that create variation. Also, there could be some gene shuffling that creates variation. That leads to then some sort of condition that comes along and selects for those that are best favored. This could be through competition within the population. This could be also an outside factor like a pesticide or some other factor. Those that cannot survive and reproduce die out. Others will survive and reproduce, and that leads to that next generation. That next generation will mate, produce offspring. Again, the more favorable variants will survive and reproduce, and eventually we will see a shift in the population, in this case, towards the darker gray circles. So in summary, after this video, you should be able to evaluate models that demonstrate how changes in the environment may result in the evolution of a population of a given species. The emergence of new species over generations or the extinction of other species due to the processes of genetic drift, gene flow, mutation, and natural selection. I hope that helps everybody out. That is video four of four for biological evolution, and we will look at some other videos soon.